Welcome back to another episode of City Life Uncensored. Pretty excited today uh, to have Matthew Simmons here, uh, a Pittsburgh legend in the uh, real estate industry. I know when I first got started in real estate, uh, he was one of the player, the main players here that uh, I looked up to and have continued to look up to to watch his business grow and how he stays focused in his mindset on, on everything he does. So extremely excited to kind of dive into through your story today, brother. Welcome. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. it's an honor. I've been, yeah, I know. I've been admiring what you guys have been doing as well, so it's mutual. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we look at we look at you and how you've grown and try to say, hey, we've got to keep going. Obviously, different business model at the end of the day. I mean, not totally, but yeah. Um, you know, I know Brian always. I mean, even early on, Brian used to always talk about what you got going on. Like, how do we emulate on the lead gen side and yeah, um, you know what you have going on. So, really, really pumped to dive into a lot of that. But first, like we do on every episode, right? We've got to we've got to know a little bit more about you before we can know how and why you've been so successful at everything that you're doing and what you're doing today. So, what's the come up, bro? Give us yeah. give us the background. Give us the story, man. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I wasn't much of a student. I knew kind of early on that college wasn't going to be for me. I did go, you know, and the grades were decent. Went to Duquesne for a little while. Went to Arizona State and kind of played around out there. Um, but I knew that wasn't really my primary focus. I think I knew from a very young age that I wanted to do my own thing. My father had a business. I watched him. Uh, he was a blue collar guy, worked my whole life. And I just knew. What kind of business your father had? So he did hardwood floors. Okay. Still does to this day in his late seventies. He's still out there sanding floors every day. Um, just the work ethic that he imparted in us. He would come home covered in sawdust. Knees were aching. Back was sore. Um, and that's just what we saw every day, seven days a week, 12 hours a day, at least out of him. And so it definitely imparted a work ethic. And it also just imparted this sense of pride when I saw that he was doing this for himself. Now, in retrospect, as we see with a lot of, I think, our fathers and, and people who are in business, not necessarily a businessman. Um, and, and I wish there was a way to go back in time and kind of help him scale through that and get mm. him out of some of that day-to-day -day stuff. But truth be told, um, while we love building teams and we love what we do, he loves crawling around on his hands and knees and working. It's all he's ever known. And so I admired that growing up and I knew I wanted to do my own thing. So went off to college because it just seemed like the right thing to do. That's what society tells us, right? Yeah. Um, but very quickly realized this wasn't for me. I had some friends that were... Um, looking to get jobs out of college. Now we're talking about 1996, 97 here. These guys were looking to get jobs out of college at PNC or Federated Investors or some of these places and start at $35,000, $40,000. Um, and I was going to have a ton of student loans. I knew that going in. Mom and dad weren't paying for college. Um, a little later on, in my, when I first graduated college, that was Literally me to a T, 43500 yeah. was my starting salary. Yeah. yeah, and you're lucky to have it now. Like yeah. Some of these kids can't even get jobs. Um, so I went and, and was uh, working at a sports store at the time. It was Here? Dunham's. Yeah, okay. Dunham's Sports. Um, oh, Dunham's, bro. And, you know, it, Love I started working there, and uh, very quickly, because it wasn't real hard to rise above some of the talent, no, no disrespect to Dunham's, but... Um, Shout out Dunham's talent, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, within a few months, they were like, well, this kid's kind of sharp. So at a young age, I was able to become a manager. And then at a very young age, I became a district manager. And I found myself looking around saying, like, the money that I'm making, the things that I'm learning here in this position, um, so far exceed my friends who are in school or getting these jobs sitting in a cubicle somewhere. Um, just did to, you have a degree or no? No, no. Okay. No. So I left college to go there, Got it. kind of made my way up through the ranks. And that's really truth be told. That's one of the only jobs I've ever had in my life. I kind of, I've learned some skills there and, um, how, I, how long did it take you to climb that? At? Um, so I, I went from uh, cashier to district manager in about seven months <laughs> and I was good timing. <laughs> so the manager of my store quit and then the uh, district manager had a little, we'll just say scandal. Um, and I was the next logical fit for any number of reasons. So, Dude, hold on. Can we tell the scandal story or no? No, no. we can't. Okay. I don't know All if, right. if that's been released <laughs> just yet. 
But uh, <laughs> it was on the news. We'll just if you want to find out, you can go do some digging. It's not hard to find out anything anymore. Anyway. So uh, I found myself as district manager doing really well. And then um, from there, I had an opportunity to head to Atlanta to go pursue like a sales consulting job. I, I knew that my niche was sales. I, I didn't have formal training. I just knew that when somebody walked through the door and they were looking to buy something, whether it was hockey equipment or an outfit, I just knew that I really enjoyed that part of it. And even as a district manager, I would find myself parked in a store somewhere and out on the sales floor wow. talking to people because I just really enjoyed it. And I started training the associates there on it. And then through some mutual friends, had an opportunity to take a job as a sales consultant um, in Atlanta, went out there. Were you looking? Uh, no, no. This was somebody who I met through the store that recognized my talent and basically said, wow, um, I think you'd be best served doing something else. I'd like to introduce you to somebody. And so he introduced me to the CEO of this company, which is no longer around. It was called Unimast. This was a steel fabricating company that sold uh, like residential and commercial steel products. So I went out to Atlanta and I worked my way up there pretty quickly. And I was selling uh, steel to, I was basically wholesaling steel to um, contractors. And, you know, steel's a commodity. Yep. So it's a relationship business. People aren't, you know, buying the best quality steel. They're buying from the people they like. And that was my specialty. So really rose up there really quickly, but was only there maybe two years. And then at the age of, so this puts me at the ripe old age of 25. Wow. I had enough saved up. I mean, by the way, it's pretty impressive the rise to the rank of a regional sales manager. At, yeah, uh, it was good. And I, at the time, I right? Probably a, a good a good sporting store at the time, right? I'm it sure was. they were still doing well. Yeah. I was doing very well. Yeah. And then with the sales job, I was doing really well back then. I mean, it was a solid six figures and um, I really thought that this was going to be my thing. I knew sales was, was my niche. I was just trying to figure out the best way to do it. Well, at the same time, at, at this point in time in your career, right? Was there, was there any thoughts creeping in your head about your own business, entrepreneurship from a sales perspective at all yet? It was always in there. Always in there. Okay. So you were trying to, trying to navigate yeah. the W2 world while, because yeah. Okay. E even as the, uh, sales consultant, I was still, I was not a W-2 employee. I was a consultant. So I had a team, but I was not, I was doing my own thing. I, I looked at it as building my own sales consulting business. And then I had an opportunity back here in Pittsburgh um, where a gym where I had worked out as a younger guy in West Mifflin was for sale. Is that where you grew up? I grew up in Baldwin. Okay. Yeah. And so a buddy of mine who was local to Pittsburgh as well reached out and said, hey, this place is for sale. I think it kind of fits our, our skill set. What are your thoughts on coming back and us buying this gym? So at 25, I came back, we bought the gym and we just blew the gym up. Um, you know, we quickly went from like six, 700 members to about 3,000. Wow. Um, very successful business in West Mifflin. Then my partner ended up going and doing his own thing, bought him out. And then uh, I took, owned the business. Was that transaction family. easy? It was. He okay. was. He had a good opportunity to go do something else. Um, and plus, I think we both felt like, based on the number of members we had, we were darn there capped out. Um, so we felt like there was a limit on how much we were ever going to make as partners. Um, but when he left, I changed the business model, started doing a lot more personal training, um, and really the revenue went through okay. the roof, like 10x the revenue. Um, and still friends today, still friends today. Good. And I owned that business for 16 years. Okay. So that wasn't kind of my foray into, to entrepreneurialism. Um, I, I did a lot of things wrong. I mean, I was 25, so you can imagine at 25, you're in a gym. Um, you have at, at the time, 30 plus employees. They're all young. They're your friends. It's very hard to to establish yourself as a as a manager. Um, so in retrospect, I've always said I would like to revisit that model again because I think I could crush it. Um, but it was still a great business, made me a lot of money, taught me a lot of what to do and what not to do. And it allowed me because of the passive income. Once you get these memberships rolling, it, there's not a ton of day to day work to keep the revenue coming in. You have to always get new members, but you have these people locked into contracts. 
So I started pursuing other business models. And then I came across this niche that I found where there were these elderly folks in Pittsburgh who obviously Allegheny County is a very elderly county. So a lot of these people needed um, safety around the house and there weren't any many companies doing it. So things like walk-in tubs, walk-in showers, stair lifts, that sort of stuff. I knew nothing about it, knew nothing about construction. This is I, after 15 years of the gym or this is this during? This is the, during, right during. around yeah. year 13, 14. Okay. I started itching like I, I got to do something else. Like this is kind of running on autopilot. Um, so I started this company called Keystone Bath and we very quickly scaled up. I got a couple contracts with the state and they would basically fax me over these orders and say the following bathrooms need remodeled in order for these people to come home. One man show rehab. at the time? I, well, I didn't do construction. So I was a one man show in the sense that I was the only person in the office, but I had two crews that went out mm -hmm. and did all the work. Um, that, that business took off. And those contracts were very lucrative. So it was like within a few months of each other, I was approached by two separate people for two separate businesses that wanted to buy it. One group wanted to buy Fitness 247 and one group wanted to buy Keystone Bath, completely unrelated. And this wasn't something that I was really even thinking about. Yeah, so they came to you? Yeah. Okay. And, um, I, you know, in the case of Fitness 247, the value was in the membership base. Um, the equipment was somewhat dated. It, it, there's no real value in a gym beyond that recurring revenue. The contracts, um, right? Yeah. yeah. But you get a multiple on that. And so I was able to sell the gym at a really great number. And then I found myself saying, okay, so now I'm going to be a full-time bathroom guy. That's not really my passion. So I ended up accepting an offer for the bathroom business as well. So both closed within about six months of each other. And this is really where my life completely moved in a different direction. And it was just like, I was finding myself sitting around, you know, I'd had some success at this point. I was probably, uh, this was 2018. So I was probably like in my early forties. Um, and I basically was like, my wife was a nurse practitioner. She had a six figure job. She was our benefits. Um, and I was just trying to figure out, I had one kid, what was I going to do with the rest of my life? Because I was just lounging all day. And it seemed like to the outside world, like this dude's got it made. Dude, let's, let's be real. You were still hitting the gym. Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that goes without saying. No, I, I've always, I have never stopped that. But in, in general, in terms of work and, yeah. and self-development. Yeah, what's your purpose type of yeah, work was, was yeah, yep. pretty lame. So, um, well, you just built two. Good company. Built, I built, built, built and sold ass, successfully yeah, but, within yeah, six you know months. Are, right? yeah. But yeah, you, that only, a few months and you're like, well, shit, well I can't golf anymore. Yeah. Like this is Dude, people talk about all the time. Like, later. oh, I yeah. can't wait to no. retire and be on a beach. I'm like, my retirement is not on a beach. I'd be bored in two days. My yeah. retirement is working. Yeah. It's just doing what I love, figuring that out. Love, right. Yeah. And so, but in addition to that, I also felt like I was lacking some things just as a man. Um, as a father, as a husband, as a son, as a friend, as a brother, I just, I knew, even though to the outside world, I had this success. Matthew, how long ago is this? This would have been, uh, I would have been 43. So I'm 47 now. Okay. 42. So about four years ago. Which, yeah. yeah. Okay. I just felt like something was missing. I, I was proud of the things I had accomplished, but when I really took a step back and I looked at just the way I operated in general, um, there were some things that I just felt like I could do better as a man. And so this is what took me down this journey was I had this period of time to reflect. Like normally at, in our 40s, you know, we're going job to job, work project to project. I really had this time to stop and sit back because financially I was in a good spot. And I had to really think about, A, like, am I proud of who I am as a man, number one, and then B, I'm not jumping into anything. The next thing that I do is going to be something that I hand selected, not because I see a niche in the market, but because this is what I want to do. Passion project, if you will. Yeah. yeah. So I listened to the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I know is so corny. Everybody says that, but literally was washing my truck, listening to that book. And I get to the end and I told my wife, I'm like, I don't know. I feel different. Like something kind of clicked for me. That was the first book. I read 
since since I had dropped out of college. Wow. I haven't read a single book since. And um, wow. from that moment on, so we're going back now four years, whatever, I've read on average a book and three quarters per week since I finished that book till now. It's impressive. So I just... I was all in, man. It was like, are you physically started. reading or do you convert to the listening? I'm all listening. Okay. I, I can't concentrate long enough. I read something. I'm like, what the fuck did I just read? So I you're not reading read. all your contracts, are you? No. Nah. <laughs> Whatever you guys put <laughs> yeah, in, read, just fine. read well in the same way. Yeah. I yeah. try reading. I, I physically read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It was okay. like one of the only books I physically read. It was, it was a struggle. But yeah. I <clears> loved it. it so I've always, I've always tried to read, actually physically read. And I'm learning, like, I don't, specifically want to so i've converted to start to listening and i'm getting more listening in now so i'm like i'm consuming more information i need to be doing this but my goal is to try to also figure out a way to also read a book here and there i gotta still work figure this all out but yeah there's definite definite benefit in reading i just struggle with it yeah Um, so for me it's also it fills my my time there is no i don't really listen to the radio a whole lot um, we haven't watched TV in four years. There's, so if I'm cutting the grass, if I'm doing whatever. <laughs> Hold on. Four <laughs> years, no TV? Four years. Steelers, and if LeBron's in the finals, that's it. That's it. Not even that's LeBron it. in the playoffs. No, no. Just the finals, yeah. <laughs> Better man than me. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't missed a damn thing. I, I can tell you, like, you think, well, what about the news? And when I first stopped watching TV was when um, there were all those terrorist attacks and people were getting abducted and – um, you know, getting their heads cut off on yeah. videos. I'm like, what am I watching? This yeah. is ridiculous. Um, and so I, I, when I started my business, I was working so late. It was a non-issue anyways. Um, but so I go through this period where I spent almost an entire year consuming mindset, personal development with no idea what I was going to do next. Just changing who I was as a man, literally what I, I would call so much, brainwashing bro. myself, because I think so often we, we are brainwashed when we're younger into what our parents believe or what society believes or our teachers believe. Yep. Um, this was an opportunity for me to brainwash myself in things that I personally believed in. Were you, were you cons- consciously or whatever the hell that word is saying, I'm going to brainwash myself? Like, was that literally and figuratively what you were thinking at the time? Or was, I'm just going to get smarter and see what happens. Like, what was the real... At that um, time, would you say, yeah. was the mindset you had? I don't think I had that much foresight in the very beginning when I first started listening to this stuff. I just was enjoying it. Okay. So I was consuming more and more. Um, but I would say, you know, a few months into it, I recognized what was happening because I was changing. I was everything about me. I was just showing up as a better human being in all my relationships. Um, and so that's when I realized, man, this is actually like brainwashing me into becoming a better version of myself. And so I went all in on that and that set me so far. I've often thought like, well, what if I would have just saw that YouTube video on wholesaling a year before and instead of spending 12 months brainwashing myself, I went right into wholesaling and I would have had an extra year under my belt before all these other people came to the market. I think those 12 months springboarded me so that when I did go into wholesaling, I was in such a good spot. I was destined to succeed. Um, So that's powerful stuff, by the way. And I want you to recognize, right. And you are, but for everybody out there listening, right? Like he literally just said he spent one year of his life without a clue what he wanted to do next. Right. Obviously after a financially successful exit of two businesses, a full year brainwashing his mindset in order to be ready to jump into his next business, right? Yeah. Like, let that soak in for a minute. It's powerful. It's amazing, yeah. right? Like, super cool. So I appreciate that. I yeah, think, I think a lot of people, to, to add to that, I think it's, <clears throat> like, I consumed, like, probably my second year as an agent, same thing, college dropped out. Yep. Never really read books, never did anything until I became an agent. Someone recommended a book, and I've really started consuming. I never had that break, though, where, mm. like, yeah, uh, I stopped pretty much working. I used to be a little more fit, but when I go to the gym, I would just consume information instead. So I was just walking on a treadmill, or right. doing steer climb, or not actually really working out. But I would still do that <laughs> every morning because I enjoyed consuming all that information. Probably my second year as an agent, hours and hours of 
stop watching the news and all that, but I never had that break to yeah. actually truly consume it all. Yeah. Like I was putting it to work, but at the same time as I was putting it to work, something I was already doing right to have all that and lay out exactly what you want to do is fascinating. Yeah. And I I've often thought about, I've had people ask me like, would you recommend this for other people? Now for you, you were blessed in the sense that you were doing something you loved. Yep. So you were consuming this information, but you, you weren't going to stop doing yeah. what you love. But I've had other people ask me, like, do you really recommend if I'm going to get into something that I spend that much time? And of course, I recognize people have to make money. Like, you can't just sit around and, and watch podcasts and read books all day. A lot of people um, think that's going to make yeah, money. Yeah. But at some point, you gotta though, make, you've yeah. got to act on it. And so I wouldn't say that, but I would say this. You need to stop viewing that as a leisure activity. And you really need to look at mindset and personal development as a revenue generating activity. So if you're spending your time cold calling, which is how I got my start, or knocking on doors, which is how I got my start, I was, I would say you wanna be 50-50 because we all know the importance of mindset and how it's actually more important than skill set. But in the beginning, you've got to, the logistics of the business you're doing, you've gotta do deals and you've gotta make money. But I would say if you can, you're not going to take a year sabbatical and do this, but if you can, while you're growing your business, carve out enough time to recognize this is a revenue generating activity. This isn't something just to fill my time. This is actually going to help me make money and do both simultaneously. I think you'll end up like years it. ahead. Yeah. So um, that's what I did. I, I got, and then I watched this YouTube video. I just started going down this, this path of what kind of businesses. And there were so many I was considering but I watched this video with Max Maxwell and uh, he was talking about wholesaling. And I was like, man, this is like, I like real estate. Um, my dad's in construction. I've always had kind of a feel for that. It's sales. It's not really real estate. It's sales and marketing, it's marketing which, yeah. which is what I like. Yeah. Um, and I told my wife after I watched that video, I said, I'm going to do this. I'm ready. I'm, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do seven figures in, in wholesaling in the next 12 months. And my wife was like, yeah, like, um, I think you are. Yeah. If you say you're going to do it, then you're going to yeah. do it. And the reason why. I Probably one of very that, few people that would be like, yeah, you're going to yes. do it. Right. Yes. Because she knows you. And yeah. And yeah. if it hadn't been for the previous 12 months, she would have, she would have not have said that. Okay. Because even when I owned my businesses, I wasn't waking up early. I wasn't Mr. Discipline in there working the books at five in the morning. I, I had things running on autopilot and I was just living the dream. Anybody who knew me back then would be like, you have the best life ever, but it wasn't fulfilling. This was different because I had spent these 12 months becoming a man of my word. And that wasn't something I could say before. And more than anything, becoming a man of my word to myself. You know, we hold everyone's commitment sacred. Oh, if I say I'm going to be there at five o'clock tomorrow, I'll be there. If I say I'm going to help you move on the weekend, I'll be there. But we don't do that for ourselves. For sure. We let ourselves off the hook. Well, over that course of that 12 months, I had worked that discipline like a muscle to a point where if I said I was going to do something, it was going to get done. It didn't matter what it was. If it was, I'm going to get up at four o'clock, I got up at four o'clock. I'm not bragging, but I've since gotten up at four o'clock, 1,462 days in a row. So I get up at four o'clock. That's what I do. That decision. You can brag made. about it a little bit. It's a pretty bit, impressive. A little bit. It's probable. <laughs> yeah. Definitely bragable. If you're sick, if you're hurt, this is if you're hungover, which has been plenty of those. Um, hopefully not tomorrow. Um, but no matter what, you're getting up. And so I made that decision. I made a decision about meditating. I made a decision about taking a cold shower. I made a decision about how much I was going to read each day. I made a decision on how many hours of cold calling I was going to do each day. And my wife watched me line these things up and one by one pick them off and change the person that I was. And so what happens with your mind is it's like, this dude's not messing around. Yeah. Like when he says he's going to do something, it happens. And so now when you set your mind to something extraordinary, like I'm going to do seven figures in wholesaling this year, your mind does not say, no, it, no, you're not. You dummy. Like you don't know anything about wholesaling. You don't know anything about real estate. In fact, I messaged a lot of real estate investors and I won't name names here in Pittsburgh and said, what do you know about wholesaling? What are your thoughts on this? And multiple people told me like, dude, don't waste your time. We've done it. It barely covers the cost of marketing. I'll buy your deals, but there's really no money in it. Wow. Um, and so I had every reason 
for my mind to say, this is not a viable model. Um, but because I had that proven track record, it supported all of my activity to make that happen. So I went down that journey and then from there, the rest is history. I mean, we, we really did, the first year I was a one man show. And then at some point I brought on a couple folks like admin um, and we scaled up to a couple million dollars a year, but truth be told, it wasn't until what my was, wife. What was the 12 months? What did you land on? 1.1. 1.1. Yeah. And it Congratulations. Was, it was coming down, thank you. It was coming down to the final month for sure. In fact, this, is, this was pretty pitiful. This was my mindset back then. Um, there was a deal I should have burned. And I wholesale it to hit my number. <laughs> hit your number. <laughs> yeah. I still look at that house like sometimes today in the north side. I'm like, I could have owned that um, like you guys and get paid three times on it. Um, but nonetheless, hit the number. And then from there, we slowly started to scale up. And uh, it really, it didn't take off like, like you see it today until my wife, who was a nurse practitioner. So she's the brains of the operation. She's never gotten a B. She's tech savvy. She's organized. She's all the things you want in a partner. And she, when we had our third, so we have three kids, seven, five, and three. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, when we had our third, our youngest, Calvin, uh, my wife was on maternity leave and she was making six figures. And I remember I had a particularly good month. It was like $220,000 for the month. And she was like, do I need to go back? Like, <laughs> oh, this seems kind of silly. Like, could I just help you? And that's what I, I didn't want to say that because she's, uh, she's very much like, in, she needs security. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, your wife's in a similar field, right? Yeah. Um, she needs that security. That's what she was raised with. Like her two options were, do you want to be a teacher? Do you want to be a nurse? Like, yo, you have your choice, either one. Um, so I didn't want to suggest it, but when those words came out of her mouth, I was like, Yes. Mm -hmm. And so adding her into the mix, when you have- two, Hide the excitement, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. When you have two spouses or partners like that, that are both on the same wavelength in terms of goals and mindset, it, it's like one, one equals like 10. And so she came on and immediately cleaned everything up, systematized my business, set up my processes. Um, and from there is when we really started to scale to a point now- where we have a COO who's a, a CMU grad who's um, really just taken our business and completely transformed it. And we have a team of 13, 14 people. Um, and, and we've been able to scale it in such a way that I'm able to take a step back from the day to day in terms of going on appointments. I'm still in the office. I'm still building rapport. I'm still, or morale. I'm still helping raise money when we need it or doing anything like that. And certainly, I still manage the sales reps and I still manage the marketing department because those are the two things that I, I enjoy. But I'm not super fond of transaction coordination or dispositions or some of the other systems and processes that my COO is. And so he runs all that and it's it's been great. So so primary business, right, of course, you know, and I want to dive into a lot of what you just said there, but just to kind of uh, make sure we have a full understanding like today, so obviously primary business, full wholesaling, right? But I'm, I'm imagining you have different things going on within mm -hmm. the realm of it because a, a good businessman, and I know how focused you always stay and are, right, naturally sees opportunities in other areas to capitalize, right? And so I know you've, you yeah. have some multifamily now, yeah. right? So what all does that business look like in total? You don't have to get into super specifics, but just generally, yeah. how has it expanded when you said it kind of took off? Yeah. So the... The reason why I love wholesaling so much is I think personally it provides a great foundation um, for any real estate business because he who has the, or she who has the deals has all the power. And so to me, I always liked the idea of having these deals and being able to cherry pick what I wanted to do with them. And so for us, that started off as always wholesaling because my first intention here from the beginning was I'm going to bank millions of dollars off of this wholesaling. And from there, I'll be able to do whatever I want to do with deals. If I want to mm -hmm. start flipping, if I want to do burrs, if I want to move into multifamily. So today, um, we've done that. You know, we have, um, we just sold at the height of the market. We sold a pretty big portfolio, but we have a couple hundred rentals. We have a multi single family. We have a multi family. We have a storage unit. Um, and we do, now it's a little different, but we were at the height of the market. We were doing a couple burrs a month, maybe one, one and a half, two. Um, 
We certainly do a majority of wholesale because that keeps the lights on. That's one thing with a scaled wholesale business is it's a grind. Like we have this monthly nut every single month that we have to hit. And so we know that we've got to wholesale a certain number of deals, no matter how attractive they are for our portfolio, just to keep the lights on because we're spending about 20% of our revenue on marketing. And we know if we start keeping and we stop generating revenue, that 20% number on marketing goes down. That's less deals and that's less for everybody. So we really try to wholesale as much as we can, but we've accumulated rentals because over the time you, you come across these portfolios that are just too good to turn down. That's been very lucrative for us. Um, so right now I'd say our business looks like about 80% wholesale. Nice. Okay. Um, probably about 10% light hotel, you know, fix and flip, just kind of lipstick on it. Um, and 10% buy and hold. So strategically, right. And you know, you know this and everyone that knows me knows this. I'm not really on the lead gen side on the front end side the sales side, what you guys do is just so amazing to me, right? How do you, right? And so I'm in different groups and masterminds, just like you are, and we all are at our level where we recognize mindset matters and getting around the right people matter yep. and all those different things. And so there's different strategies that go along with wholesaling, right? We throw out the word wholesaling and people, you know, a lot of people have negative connotations, good sure. content, all of these different things. And you've kind of said from day one, I'm a wholesaler and I'm proud of it and I'm going to yep. crush and you do, Right. But there's reverse wholesaling and there's yep. wholesaling and like thousands of words that ultimately I don't even know. Sure. Like what, how has that been for you strategically? What has always been yep. your approach? Have you found one more successful than the other that you recommend? Or what is your real strategic thought process that goes yep. into the overall idea of wholesaling and route that you take? Yeah, great question. So for me in the beginning, wholesaling was a path to quick money. I wasn't so much looking at what's the best ROI for this lead it was, what's the quickest way for me to get some money? I wanted to bank some money. That was my goal from the beginning, was just to have a, a purse so that when opportunity presented itself- Yeah, a million bucks money. in one year. Yeah, I wanted to have- and with, Year with, one in it. With no staff. So the margins that first year were just crazy when I look back now. Yeah, I can um, imagine. Yeah, so- We um, went opposite. We just started hiring. Yeah. <laughs> million um, dollars in staff first year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's paying off. Trust me. I'm not going to listen to any poor mouth and out of YouTube. Um, so in the beginning, it was about quick money. But what we've graduated to now, which is something I would recommend for any real estate investor, is do not make decisions for exit strategy based on some predefined definition of what you do. I'm a flipper. I'm a wholesaler. I'm a buy and hold guy. No. You're a real estate investor, and if you're smart, your job is to maximize your ROI on every lead that you get in. And so that's where we've gotten to now. And so what we do is we get a deal under contract, we bring it in, and myself, my wife, and my um, COO, we underwrite it. And we basically look at it on a chart, and we consider, where's the best bang for our buck here? Okay, we can wholesale it. And in 30 days, we can make $15,000. Okay, that's point A. Point Z is we could spend 60 and make 50. And then there's a million points in between there where I think people miss the boat. You don't have to either wholesale it or flip it. We analyze it at every phase of renovation to determine when's the right point to back out of this and cash out. And so for us, we'll say, okay, 30 days, $15,000 here. What about 45 days and we make 25 with just carpet and paint? What about 60 days, carpet, paint, and we you know, fix that retaining wall? And we go all the way down the line to the flip and we determine based on time invested and the ROI, when's the perfect time to cash out on this property? If it's wholesale, it's wholesale. If it's flip, we're willing to flip. But I think so many people make the mistake of, well, I've got to take this thing all the way to the finish line. Certainly if you're doing a burr or you're going to keep it for your own portfolio, it makes sense, right? You're trying to get that appraisal or you're going to have to manage it so you don't want it to be half-assed. But if you're selling the property, you don't owe it to anyone to take it all the way to a HGTV style flip. There are families that wish 
they could buy that property somewhere in the middle and put a little sweat equity in there and, and live there for the rest of their lives. And so that's where we've gotten to now from a wholesaling perspective is it turns out where the market is right now, wholesaling is still a great way to go because we're finding that we have no leverage with buyers in this intermediary position here and we're getting picked apart on inspections. Okay. But a year ago, six months ago, that middle ground was right where we wanted to be because those flips we were seeing were selling for 250 and we were just getting these things up to a super clean grandma special and they were selling for 225. Yeah. So it was like, this is, we're crazy not to do this. Now we're finding wholesaling makes the most sense. A year ago, we were doing a lot of that middle ground stuff. The one thing I will say about wholesaling has changed for me, and I'm going to be completely honest. I didn't do this when I first started because the people I was watching weren't doing this. I came up in that mindset of tell them you're buying the house. Tell them you're a cash buyer and you want to buy the house and then tell them you have to get your contractors through and or your whatever your business partner that, that that theory is what gives in general sometimes yeah. the the bad name it's for absolutely. wholesalers right and it should and so i went through that phase and did the, that whole first year that million dollars that was all built on the back of that um now in my mind i justified it as hey i'm getting you what you want um and so i don't I'm not going to feel guilty about it but now that i look at it there's so much competition that I find that for us, we're better off to go in and say, here's what I'm doing. And guess what? They're all doing it too. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm doing because we're better at it than anybody else. Nobody else can move your property as efficiently as we can. So now we go in and we make our offer from a wholesaling perspective, which is typically going to be a low anchor. And that's a number that we are 100% confident no matter what happens here, we will buy this house. We would love to buy this house at this price because we can do that middle ground. We can flip it. We can burr it. Maybe we just buy it cash and put it in our portfolio. We can do that now. So we make that lowball offer. But rarely do they say, okay, let's, let's do it, right? So from there, they're typically going to say, well, that kind of number doesn't work for me. And it's very simple then to transition into an honest conversation around wholesaling where you don't have to use the word, but you can simply say, well, Mr. Seller, I completely understand where you're coming from. In fact, I think your expectations on price are pretty reasonable. That just doesn't fit my model. That being said, if there is a cash buyer in this market that will pay that number, they are in my network mm -hmm. because we've been doing this longer than anybody. We have more relationships, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you're interested, like I said, I'm not your buyer. Well, what happens when you say I'm not your buyer? Right away, they, they put their guard down. It's you're on the no same longer, team, right? Yeah, it's yeah. no longer this adversarial relationship. I'm not, dude, I'm not buying your property. I'll help you, but I, I'm not your buyer. And so you've now created a partnership with them rather than a, a, an opposition. So you say something to the effect of, if you want, I'd be happy to share this with some other guys and gals who I know buy in this area. This is a lot more in their wheelhouse than it is mine. And you, you say whatever the reason, it's a little far away from me. It's a little more repairs that I'm looking to take on. It's a tighter deal for me. Some of the other guys who don't do the kind of marketing that I do, they can pick up these tighter deals. Maybe they don't have as big a team, but I'd be happy to introduce you all. Which by the way, all of that is relatively true because there's a reason why every time, because you just said it yourself, for that price, you're willing to take it down. Right. For this price, I'm not. There's a reason why. Yep. Just be open and on and honest and authentic about it. And that's going to create, yeah. again, like you said, their guard comes down. Right. And very rarely, if ever, ever do we get any pushback on that. Since we transitioned to that, number one, I sleep a lot better at night. I'm proud of our business um, because we're, we're honest about it. But additionally, the people find it very endearing for you to come forward like that and tell them, this is what I'm doing. So now you just say, if you'd like, I'll introduce you guys. If it works out great, you know, you guys will do the transaction. They'll throw me a few bucks for the referral. And maybe the next time I get a deal and I send them one, they'll send me a referral. Um, but it doesn't cost you anything. Do you, do you want me to do that for you? So what are you doing at that point? At that point, you just ask for permission to wholesale it. And they're thanking you for it. Yeah. Rather than going in and hiding it and saying, I'm buying it and then trying to work around it. 
you're going in and asking them, can I wholesale your house? And they're at the end of the appointment saying, thank you so much for helping me. I mean, despite it not being a good fit for you, the fact that you're willing to do this for me is so great. It's such a different conversation and a different vibe. So at that point now, you've got permission to wholesale it. You tell them, if we can't find you a buyer, you're signing a contract. But if we can't find you a buyer, like I'm off the hook. Mm -hmm. I'm not buying it. I'm telling you that right up front. And my contract clearly states that. So now there's no angst when the deal doesn't go through because now it's more of just a negotiation where you, you, and by the way, when you want to show the property, it's as simple as calling up the seller and say, Hey, Mr. Seller, uh, I shared that deal with a few of my buddies and I got good news, man. Wednesday at two, I have three people that want to come check it out. All right, I'll be here. I'm going to get this place cleaned up. No more of this like, Hey, this is my contractor, Sally. She's 82 and driving a white Lexus. Yeah. Like that doesn't, I got to hide this and that and whatever else yeah. people outside. Yeah. 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 So now it's just up front, And so you bring them through and the sellers on their best behavior because these are their buyers. Mm-hmm. And then the buyers come back to me with their offer and not in my case, but in Tina. And now if you don't get an offer, that's as high as what this guy ultimately wanted. Now you've essentially done a case study for him and said, not only do I not like this at this price, Mr. Seller, but none of my peers want it either. And so now they feel like, man, maybe I am unreasonable. And so one of two things typically happens. You're going to get an offer and you're going to go back to the seller and say, hey, you know, I know you said you wanted 60,000. I told you I was going to be at 40. Um, Good news is I got somebody who's willing to pay more than that. The bad news is it's still less than your 60, but she's a solid buyer closes quickly, buys a ton, no inspections, no contingencies, going to pay all your closing costs, transfer tax. You can leave the stuff in the house. Um, But she's at 55. What do you want me to tell her? Should I tell her to kick rocks? And almost every time, one of two things happens. Either A, see if you can get her up to 57. And now you're negotiating both sides. Again, it's you on the same team as this seller now negotiating your wholesale fee. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's gorgeous. Or two, they say, well, would you come up to like 45? Because I, I don't know. I just really like the way you operate. And I don't know her. And I, I like the more money. But, man, you've been, you've been great. I, I'll get, I would do wow. it with you for 45. I didn't even think about that side. So now you're doing it for 45. The catch is when you do it for 45 you got to close on it. Yeah. Like, I, so I'm now you're looking at now. your other strategies. I'm looking at my other strategies or I'm just double closing on a wholesale. Deal. Okay. So, so same. I, I can wholesale in good faith if I close on it after I told them, yeah. but I'm not going to assign that contract. And it, it, again, go back to this really weird situation where who's this LLC that I've never seen before on the HUD and all that. No, Mr. Seller, I, if you give me that number, I'll buy it. We're done. And nobody else. You still go it. do it anyways. You go do it, but you do it. On a double close. Yeah. So you pay a little bit more, but ultimately you're making up the difference. Yes. So Everybody wins. Real life situation. Right before you got here, um, spoke with Tina. Said you had to go back to the sellers and renegotiate a little bit from an offer I put in. Yeah. Uh, I guess sellers decided to come down a little bit. So we're going to get a deal done. We just have to close fast. A little more hand money. So right for the right, record, right this was literally walked. right before you oh, walked really? in. Yeah. yeah. He was on the phone fair. with Tina. Yeah. So I don't know if you did the renegotiation. So I, I don't do any Tina, of that, thankfully. Yeah, so Tina did an awesome job, but yeah. Good. We're, we're locking them. Actually, should be Tina doesn't with you renegotiate today. either. That would be one of the acquisition reps, but that's good to hear. Yeah, we found in this market, um, we are telling people right up front, the market's falling like crazy, and this is, to the best of our knowledge, the number that we think is going to work. But we don't say we're coming back to renegotiate, but we're setting the table yep. that this is a possibility that we're going to have to come back and have that conversation. Um, And most of our sellers have been pretty amenable to it. Now, I will say this. One of the things that I find appalling, which is a a regular practice among a lot of really well-respected wholesalers, is they're retrading on price or renegotiating every single deal. Their sales manager is saying, you have a $50,000 spread, go get me $65,000. You have a $60,000 spread, Go, That's go. happening at the national level a lot. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so I really have a problem with that. To me, if you have a healthy spread and you have a buyer, 
don't go back and steal a little more equity from the lady. Like you have a deal, it is what it is. But I'm worried because what we've learned is sellers, this market has shown everybody, sellers are amenable to price reductions. And so my concern is you're doing it now out of necessity because you're looking at it and saying, okay, I got this thing under contract for 50. All my buyers are coming back at 45. I've got to go renegotiate down to 40. That's one thing. If it's the only way to consummate the deal. What I have a problem with is we've all learned, and I'm telling you, it's like over 90% of sellers are agreeable to a price reduction. My concern is when the market shifts again, we've all been programmed. You can just renegotiate with these sellers at will, and they're going to say yes. Keep in mind, they don't know what the spread is. So if six months from now, you have it at 50, and you've got buyers at 85, there's nothing stopping you from taking advantage of that 90% success rate and going back and making that number 40. And if you do 200 plus deals a year like we do, and you add another 10% on all of your spreads, it's in, off the charts. I have a major problem with that. And I just know so many guys right now that are renegotiating everything, even after it's assigned for a healthy spread, they're going back. Is it terrible. a moral issue for you or is it more of an industry worry concern for you? What's the... Um, there's definitely an industry concern because obviously this is being watched very closely. Mm -hmm. But more than anything, it's it's a moral issue. I, I want to make money um, and all of our big spreads, truth be told, are when people, buyers, no disrespect to any buyers in the room, when they do something really stupid. Like when they throw out a number that we're just like, mm -hmm. every time we've ever had a six-figure wholesale deal, it's because we locked it up at a number that we knew was a good deal. We didn't know quite how good. And we send it out, we get it for 50, or in this case, we say, we get it for 100, we send it out for 152, and we get an offer for 210 when the next highest offer was like 159. But there's that one guy and you're like, what the hell is this? Dude, I can't do it. Whenever the market was prime, right? I can't even tell you the amount of times where like we would underwrite a deal to buy from you. Right. And like, we'd come up with a number. We'd literally stop going to all of your open houses because they're like, he has so many dummies <laughs> paying ridiculous numbers that don't even, I don't know how they're making money. We're like, we're not even going to waste time going because of what yeah. you just said there. I think it's, a, I want you to touch on it because I think it's, it's fascinating and it's a great point. I think, you know, it's something we're trying to focus on more and more now from a team aspect on the lead gen. Again, I'm not involved a ton with it. Brian handles a lot of that. Right. But I think it is absolutely such an incredibly strong point you made. If you don't, control the marketing and the lead generation side, control the deal, like you mentioned early on, right? You don't ultimately have control. So we knew that early on too. So we obviously are, are I don't believe in competition. I'm a big abundance, yeah. abundance mindset guy, right? But obviously we have our own entire lead generation department. Yeah. We're out there doing that as well as, of course, we're going to pay your spread and pay spreads to wholesalers because like, it doesn't matter to us if the numbers work for us. That's great. We want everybody to do well, right? But we knew that. Yeah. And obviously, you know, you've mentioned it. you're kind of running the organization. Now, Brian does a lot of that. He's, you know, more recently got more back involved than, you know, we were on the phone last week and like I was on appointment for the first yeah. time in forever. Right. So I think a little bit of the market might be bringing us back down in the leads a little bit ultimately on a lead gen, because again, the market took a hit, yeah. but what is it like for you or how has the challenge been like all these good ideas and crazy ways and different exit strategies, whether it be innovation or a, <sighs> you know, a, a takedown and a double close or all the way to a flip and all of these different strategies. How is it and how has it been to try to train train a team, create an organization, different positions within the organization that can ultimately create a, you know, a larger organization of which is doing, it's a business, yeah. you know, it's not just a wholesaler anymore, right? Because yeah. there's thousands of wholesalers. Yeah. You have a wholesaling business. Right. You're no longer a wholesaler. You're the CEO of a wholesaling business. Right. How has that been for you? And what are some challenges that you've had? So I learned this the hard way, but one of the things that we've been very careful to do is not bog their minds down with any of that. So we're not trying to teach them how to do that stuff. Okay. Um, my reps in the field, they don't know a ton about the logistics of an ovation. They don't know how to do seller finance. Some of them do, but that's not their thing. They're not caught up in this the, the regulations around sub twos. They don't know anything about wrapping a mortgage. They don't know any of that stuff. Um, 
what they know is what we talk about every single morning at 9 a.m. on our acquisition title, <clears throat> which is how to buy properties below market value. And that's what we focus on. We spend all of our time with them focused on how to buy the property below market value. It's not your responsibility to try to figure out what we're going to do with it. We'll do that in-house as underwriters. Your job is to bring me back a signed contract as low as you can possibly get it. And if you do a good job, it's going to pencil out for one of our strategies. When we found that, <coughs> excuse me, when we found that we were training them on things like creative strategies and other things, it's like chasing two rabbits. Their wholesale numbers went to shit because now they're they're like, oh, these creative deals, especially the way I compensate my team, they're keeping creative deals for their own portfolio. So you can imagine if you go in the house and, and somebody seems somewhat amenable to seller finance, yeah. it's going to be really hard to not be like a dog on a bone with that because that's potentially going in your portfolio. And so their wholesaler numbers went down. And so what we've done is just said, go in, get a signed contract. If they're interested in wholesaling or they're interested in creative, send them to the creative guy. You're not the creative guy or the creative girl. I have a guy for that. It's still your deal. We're going to work it for you, but let them do it and go find me another wholesale deal. Same with Novation. Bring it in-house. All our contracts allow us to Novate if we want to. So we don't have to go back and get Novation contract signed. The contract has it in there. Um, rarely do we get pushback on it. And I hear so many people saying, well, you know, how are your sellers agreeing? To, it's all about how much rapport you've built with that seller. I don't want to say we can plop anything down in front of them, but we put some things in our contract that are very heavily weighted in our favor if shit goes sideways. And we very rarely get pushback. Even from attorneys, on occasion, they'll say, hey, can you strike this? Can you add this? Whatever. But for the most part, they're comfortable with it. And so by taking that out of their minds and just training them on acquisitions. We spend an obnoxious amount of time training on sales every day. Now they're going into the house and they're just bringing back contracts that are signed at numbers that we have any number of exit strategies at our fingertips. So obviously, right, dude, you're clearly the uh, sales guy and a sales expert, right? So with your team, I'm sure you're leading the show and I'm sure there's a lot of involvement, et cetera, from a sales training perspective. But the fact of the reality is most organizations, most wholesalers across the country, here's in Pittsburgh, right? Anyone listening to this don't have you to meet with them every day at 9 a.m. What do, would you recommend? Like, how do we get better at wholesaling if that's what we want to do? Yeah, I would say um, just in the interest of full disclosure, we pay for two professional sales training organizations. We pay for John Martinez, which I'm sure you've heard of. And that's just what, what I like about Martinez is it's modules that these people can watch on their own time. And then John, I think he's officially retired, but the company still exists, um, once a week would go on and teach that module live for an hour or two. So now when you have people coming in, what I was finding was I can only pour so much into these people. Like, And that's the other thing. My style is very much relationship based. It's the I, I think it's the way I craft my words. It's the way I pause here and the way I say things. I can't tell someone else how to do that. In fact, what I've learned is the best salespeople are more process driven, engineer minds like a Steve Trang type who are just going to follow the steps to the process because guys like me typically. They're scattered. They're disorganized. They have no follow-up. The CRM's a mess. All of those things. So if you're just trying to sell a car or buy a few houses, you can do that probably more effectively through a guy like me. But if you want to scale, you need someone who's the full package. And I was finding that I couldn't get in there and teach them all of that stuff because so much of what has driven my success is me. And I can't make you me. Mm -hmm. So now That's we right. hired yep. this Martinez and... And it's built-in training where it's like, I think it's eight or 10 modules. They're an hour or so each. And it starts with building rapport, asking questions, mirroring all the way through the perfect appointment and how to conduct yourself. So that gives all of our folks a baseline before they get with me. So now I'm not teaching them 
how to say hello to somebody in an appointment. Like we got the basics down so that we can build upon that and scale much quicker. Then the second thing is Steve Trang offers a monthly sales training, which is just a live sales training call once, actually once a week, I think. I think it's once a week um, where you just go on. There's a big group and he picks one topic to train on. And it might be um, how to overcome the objection that I need to talk with my wife first. And so for an hour, he's going to talk That's about cool. that and everybody's going to ask questions. So I am I take it so serious that I'm not so arrogant to think that just my voice is enough. It doesn't matter how good I'm at it. I can only impart so much on you. And I'm telling you, there's something about people talk about this with their children where it's like, I've told my son this a hundred times, but until his coach said it, it didn't really resonate. Well, I, I hear them talking about things on calls where they're like, did you hear when he said this? That's such a good idea. I'm like, dude, I've been saying that for years. <laughs> but hearing a different voice gives it validity. And so it's not something we take lightly. We spend a lot of time every week honing our skills from a sales perspective because we recognize, and, and I mean no disrespect to any of the systems or process people, if you don't have that, you just don't have a business. What, uh, how many transactions did you do in 2022? Uh, I don't even know the exact number, but it's somewhere between like 210 and 240, somewhere in there, depending on where we wound up. Beautiful. You know, maybe the business as well as just you in general, you know, what's next, you know, next year, next five years, where you see yourself going, bro? Yeah. So, you know, we've been, um, we've been keeping a lot more since this transition in the market. Um, I'm hopeful that the market gets even a little juicier and maybe a little more dicey because what I've found is. For the record, before you keep going, I don't know if anybody just heard that, but he just said juicy and dicey (laughs) in the same sentence. I want everyone to hear that, right? Because he is a mindset of the worse it gets out there, the more opportunity and the better it's going to get for him. So that's extremely key for everyone to realize that. Yeah, and that's twofold. One is because it drives out some of the players that, I'm not trying to drive out guys and gals that are trying to make an honest living at wholesaling, but some of the folks that are doing it wrong, um, it, this market is just going to wash them out. It's not sustainable. So you're going to see the cream rise to the top, which I think you've already seen. There's some great people sleep on Pittsburgh from a wholesaling perspective. I know just from being in other markets, Pittsburgh has some really talented organizations and guys individually who are doing wholesaling here. So there's already the cream has kind of risen to the top. But in addition to that, as these prices continue to drop, something that we've never capitalized on is the MLS. I know you guys work the MLS. That's not something we've ever done. And so I'm looking forward to being able to go in and buy deals off the MLS. We've already bought three or four since the market's kind of shifted, which is three or four more than we ever had before. But we're starting to hear that our offers are being considered. We're starting to get counters on these low ball offers, which before they were just saying to piss off. So I'm excited to see where that goes because that's an opportunity for us to build our portfolio even more. And ultimately, truth be told, if I can continue to scale up that portion of the business, I don't have any partners. We have really, really healthy profit margins. We, My wife and I own the portfolio ourselves. We don't need a thousand rentals mm-hmm. to be on easy street. We really don't. And so for us, we get a couple couple hundred more rentals, um, I, and we're already in Just a, a couple spot. hundred more. Yeah. Um, a few hundred more. <laughs> but in this market, I think that's attainable. I, I think we'll- For um, sure, bro. You'll we'll get there. We'll be able to enjoy the kids even more. So that's the goal, is right? You just want to be able to spend more time with the family. I'm 47, about to turn 48. At this stage of my life, as much as I love the hustle and the grind, I'm not going to be on a beach every day. I'm not going to be golfing every day, but I could also be satisfied taking a step back and spending more time at home. I love it. Is there anything you have on that vision board? It's like a clear cut goal for you for the next called five years. I'm just curious if it's a line item, if you're willing to share. Yeah, for sure. Um, So for us, I always thought that this is literally what I thought. 150 rentals was going to equal because we, the way we underwrite our deals, we, we plan on about $300 a month cash flow net, mm-hmm. right? Um, so therefore, I thought 150 rentals was $50,000 a month. And 
I mean, I could live pretty comfortably on $50,000 a month passive. Um, I've come to realize that 150 rentals doesn't equal $50,000 a month passive. Nor does that passive <laughs> probably equal the lifestyle you ultimately want right. with inflation. <laughs> and so we, um, we were just like, we had to reevaluate. We really had to 10 X our goals and just say like, yep. we thought that that was a crazy number. And at the time for people who didn't know anything about real estate, it was a crazy number to throw out there. But then as you start to realize these things, you say, man, that's not going to get it done. Mm -hmm. Like neither the 150 or the 50. And so for us, um, you know, we have some numbers that my wife and I have in mind in terms of passive income where we feel like we'd be really comfortable in terms of being able to spend a little more time at home. But I'm not in any hurry. We're, we're enjoying ourselves. We live in Swickley. We walk to our office. We walk. I saw Starbucks. you the other day over there. Yeah. You beeped at me. I mean, we like, <laughs> we got it. We walk our kids to school. We walk to the movie theater. We walk to the gym. We walk to the grocery store. Um, what are we trying to escape here? Yeah. The, the idea is to build a life that is a dream so that you're not just trying to get away from it. We love it. It's, it's a little cliche, right? But it's truly financial freedom is what you're yeah. after, right? Yeah, yeah for sure. I love that. What, uh, you know, if you give any advice, what, what's the what's the, probably the number one piece of advice that you have that you would give right now to anyone? Yeah, I would say, um, honestly, it's what we just talked about. It's that idea of aiming a little higher. I wish, in retrospect, when I first started that mindset work, I had exposure to more um, things like Grant Cardone. That wasn't really on my radar. Some of these guys who really can convince you that there's nothing you can't achieve. I was working on mindset, but it wasn't of the mind that I was going to be a billionaire. It was just... I'm going to become a better person. And I think that was a great way to start. Um, but we set some goals like a million dollars a year, my first year wholesaling. I can't help but wonder if that goal had been 1.5, if I would have hit yeah. it. Um, and so yeah. since then, um, I've really scaled up my goals and really um, it's allowed me to grow exponentially quicker. So I would just say think bigger. Um, you really, the, the, the concept of 10 X is a real thing. Like whatever you think you want to do 10 X it, because, uh, when you get there, you'll, you'll be excited, but you'll also be disappointed because it's not what you thought it was going to be. So I I'd say it. just, just expand your mind in that sense. I love it. Any questions from you over there, big dog? No, there's probably a take a whole nother episode of yeah. getting well, we'll, we'll have to get you back down here again too. We told David Allen the same, a lot of. A lot of amazing stuff, man. Where can we find you if we want to get a hold of you? Don't find me. Yeah, Leave you don't me. want found. Leave him go, baby. <laughs> no, um, you know, I, I still have an Instagram, although it gets hacked a lot. <laughs> and I'm like, I forget my password and shit. But I think I'm the real Matthew Simmons. The real. The real there's just so many imposters. Um, but yeah, at the real Matthew Simmons on Instagram. Um, I'm on Facebook, but. You can find his you can find his company on the uh the, the commercials even though he's not yeah, watching his own stuff. Check your mailbox. Yeah, chances are if you have any equity <laughs> or you don't cut your grass, you'll be hearing from me. Yeah, incredible lead generator, incredible businessman. Uh we are extremely fortunate to to have you on the podcast, brother. And uh shout out to the Steel City Syndicate. Uh Matthew is a, a player in our syndicate. We love having him there every month. He actually is coming today to give a, a presentation for everybody that's in our mastermind. So luckily for us, we get to experience some more of, of uh, the education that you are willing to share. So thank you so much, brother. Really appreciate you having and uh, let's go.